Good morning, everyone. The last seat's just, just filling up. Um, a very, very warm welcome to you at the start of the IFG's 10th anniversary conference. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, I'm the director here, and I'm really delighted to uh, have brought together with you all so many uh, people and interesting discussions for the rest of the day. And indeed, our fascinating keynote speaker and speech that we're going to come on to in a bit. Very start, let me just say a couple of things. I'm very glad to be working with a range of partners on this, PA Consulting, <coughs> our headline uh, partner, and the Advertising Association, APM, Burgess Salmon, and the Civil Service College. And we're very glad to have their support on this conference. And a second thing, a nod to the pressing events in UK politics at the moment, session three on financial management, of management of revenues and spending is going to follow on immediately from session two, that is at 11.30, not 11.45, because of a vote in the House of Commons that the panelists have to get away from. And I'm not uh, promising you that that's the end of timetable adjustments and drama that British politics may inject. I'm going to say things, a few things very briefly about the IFG at the beginning to let you know uh, our about our program and some of the things that we're saying at the moment. The IFG was founded just over 10 years ago to make government more effective. The inspiration for it came out of our chairman David Sainsbury's time, his eight years as science and technology minister in government and close observation from that perspective of what our government did do well and what it could do much better. Our focus is on the UK, but we draw a lot on experience from other countries and we share our conclusions with them. We have had a lot of success uh, in the past 10 years in bringing about some change. There's an awful lot more uh, where we either feel our recommendations have not yet had the desired effect um, or where we're persisting and I'm certainly not offering the current state of UK government as evidence of our effectiveness ourselves, <laughs> but we will keep going. Let me start first just telling you a bit about our work and then I'm going to offer three bits of advice drawing on that work for the next Prime Minister, whoever that may be. I have one slide, this is a brief talk. Um, this is our work, the main pillars of our work are across the top here. Um, as you can see, ministers, civil service, parliament, public services, policy making, public finances. And in our policy making work, we urge governments to use evidence and test what works before leaping into action. There are a lot of examples of failure to do this, more than I would like to cite here, but the rushed privatization of the prison service of the probation services is, is one, of, one of those. And the very sudden announcement in March of the tariffs that the UK would impose on imports in the event of no deal, affecting every sector of this economy, coming uh, very abruptly without introduction or apparent analysis would be another. The civil service has got much more formal about this, but the rapid rotation of staff, particularly in the treasury, something that we've picked up on, does nothing to help institutional memory. Some ministers are good at this, some are not. Public finances, the end there covers the management of public spending and the design of tax policy, and we're going to be talking about that in one of the sessions today. And these are among the greatest challenges of modern government, particularly with an aging society. And then on the mine below, I'm going to put projects with special attention at the moment. Brexit, very noisy in its own lurid orange there, and a big part of our work at the moment. Um, devolution, outsourcing, technology in government, and accountability also key areas for us where we're giving a particular drive at the moment. Accountability goes to the heart of what we write about, the importance of clarity of responsibility and being, being able to hold government to account and individuals within government to account. And it gives government its most powerful incentive to improve when you come down to it. And the last one, professional development is something that distinguishes us from lots of think tanks. We provide private advice to ministers, civil servants, MPs, about how they might be more effective and we advise the opposition, any opposition, on preparing for government at a point when it seems that an election might be imminent. We are 
I can think I can say without huge controversy, uh, hovering in that kind of period at the moment. You also have a copy of the book by my predecessor, Peter Riddle, going to be published tomorrow, which captures some of that advice on how to be a minister. No job resembles being a minister in the scale of what is demanded, the range of skills it calls on, the range of knowledge it calls on, and the lack of instruction or preparation. And we're happy to play a part in filling that gap. So let me turn to the question of what, drawing on this work, we might say to the next Prime Minister. First, on Brexit. The chances of no deal have risen because of the nature of the competition for the next leader of the Conservative Party. The party membership is inclined to pick someone more comfortable with the notion of no deal than Theresa May has been. The Institute stands by our warnings about the risk of disruption and economic damage that leaving with no deal presents to the UK. As well as the constitutional strains, which are considerable, strains to the government's relationship with Parliament, to the neutrality of the monarchy, it will also increase pressures for Scottish independence and for a border poll in Northern Ireland, raising the chances of a breakup of the Union. The Conservative candidates who seem to be more comfortable with a no-deal Brexit, that is Boris Johnson, Jeremy Hunt, Andrea Leadsom, Dominic Raab, need to be clear about what this means and how they would handle it. To take just a few of our main concerns, the Civil Service has said no further primary legislation is essential, but leaving without a deal will create considerable legal uncertainty that will need to be resolved rapidly. Given the sheer volume of traffic through the, the short straits crossing, the short distances crossing, say Calais to Dover, there is almost certain to be disruption to supply chains. And perhaps above all, there is not yet a credible solution to the Irish border problem in the event of no deal. Brexit will create a border which needs to fall somewhere. Republic of Ireland agricultural products would continue to flow north if the UK chose to keep the border open, its current policy, but Northern Irish goods would face immediate new checks if the EU follows through its current plans to treat the UK immediately as a third country. There are concerns that those on the losing side of this trade, for example, people and farmers in Northern Ireland might seek to block <coughs> farming goods coming north and an impromptu border could be thrown up in hours officials have warned us. Beyond that, as Donald Trump reminded us last week, the UK will face tough choices in trade deals it seeks to do with other countries. It's going to be a binary choice between remaining close to EU standards or moving towards those of the US. And the backlash last week when Dominic Raab suggested proroguing Parliament if it tried to prevent the UK leaving without a deal should be a warning to any candidate thinking of this route. MPs might, as the Institute have said, struggle to find technical ways to stop a Prime Minister intent on no deal, but any Prime Minister would find it very hard to govern having shut Parliament out of the biggest decision in generations. And that's not the end of the constitutional problems. Our second piece of advice to the new Prime Minister relates to devolution. We spent a lot of time looking uh, this summer at the 20 years of this uh, significant experiment that the UK has performed on itself and its own government. Uh, the next Prime Minister ignores the strains on the Union uh, and on that devolution settlement at his or her peril. It's fair to say, and we're arguing this in a book of essays out soon, that devolution overall has been a big success in increasing people's sense of being governed at a local level. Much harder to show what it's done economically, whether or not the famous devolution dividend has really come through. It's unfortunately e easier to show that it hasn't been good for public services in Scotland, Northern Ireland, or Wales, although there is a healthy debate about whether you blame devolution itself, the elected governments, or the lack of funding for that. That goes on. Certainly, though, no one wants to turn the clock back, but a sense it could be made uh, to work much better, but Brexit has then landed on top of all that with its own complexities. And the question is whether devolution has made it the UK stronger as a union, as Tony Blair hoped when he set the UK on this path, or laid the ground for its breakup. Scotland and Northern Ireland were very firmly for Remain. Wales, where an independence movement has not been strong, still feels neglected in money and powers. 
and the next Prime Minister, in our view, needs to pay attention very quickly to these concerns if he or she is not to find that the question of whether parts of the UK break away <coughs> dominates the coming years. Our third piece of advice is about public services. The challenge of meeting people's expectations is not going to go away, something I think our keynote speaker is indeed going to uh, dwell on at some length. The economic consequences of Brexit may make it worse. Our widely praised performance tracker annual report, which looks at money going into public services and how they perform as a result, shows how much prisons, courts and social care for the elderly have deteriorated during recent cuts. The new Prime Minister needs to be straight with the public about the choices that are going to follow on tax as well as on spending. And if nothing changes, then current trends will make the UK, as some have put it, a health service with a small country attached. In trying to tackle these pressures on public services, it would be a mistake to recoil, as the Labour opposition or some, of the, some within it have seemed to do, from the fact that many are delivered privately. Even the NHS, as we've pointed out buys, out, buys in a lot of its services and medicines from private companies. And despite the uproar caused by Trump's comments on access for US firms last week, that remains a fact. It is no solution to cost or quality to seek to bring those services back into government as a matter of principle. Some have worked very well for the public's benefit, others, probation again, less so. But procurement from the private sector is a third of government spending, as the Institute has shown. It's too big to abolish, and indeed, it's sometimes yielded important benefits. Our point is that it needs to be run better, and the right services and constructions picked for working with the private sector, but not to get rid of it all. We're going to publish a clear guide for government on how to do that, uh, how, to, how and when to commission work from the private sector to bring some evidence and principles to what has become a very heated area. You can be able to see throughout the day, uh, not only on the panels, but in the front hall on the landing, some of the work we do. If you've got suggestions for what we ought to be working on and oh, for collaborations, I'm always very, very pleased to hear that. I'm going to stop now about the IFG and I'm now going to introduce the keynote speaker to open our conference. Thank you.